Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into things. A podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 159, Social Phobia. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my sociable and outgoing co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. Again, don't really think that describes me, but sure. Well, this is what we're shooting for at the end of the episode. Fair enough. I'm projecting, we'll say. How are you doing today, Maddie? Doing all right. How about you? Doing pretty good. Uh, so far, so good this week. Anything exciting on your end? Um, not really much. Kind of just getting back into the swing of things still. Still, huh? It takes a while, huh? Okay, I guess. I was uh, fortunate enough to make a trip to scenic Salisbury, Maryland on Tuesday. and got to see the team down there, so that was fun. Broke up the week a little bit. Yay. But other than that, nothing exciting for me. Mm. So today we are talking social phobia. Now we touched on it <clears throat> kind of by mention last week when we were talking about shyness. And social phobia is kind of an extension, kind of an extreme extension of shyness. Uh, social phobia is something most of us experience at one time or another at varying degrees of severity. It's that nervous feeling you get if you speak in front of a group, that shy feeling you experience around others who aren't in your inner circle, or the self-consciousness you may experience out in public for any number of reasons. But social phobia that is uncontrolled and severe can be crippling and lead to other issues. On today's episode of Insights into Teens, we're going to take a look at what social phobia is, what causes it, how it can affect your life, and ultimately, how you can deal with it. But before we do that... I would like to invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions of Insights into Teens listed as Insights into Teens on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. You can also find audio versions and video versions of all the network's podcasts listed as Insights into Things at those same locations. We would also invite you to write in, give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. Or you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcasts. Are we ready? I guess we have to be. Okay. We don't have to be. We can chit chat for a little bit longer if you'd like. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. Here we go. So our research comes to us again from our kidshealth.org website. I think the next few weeks we'll be drawing from that same resource. It's a very good resource. So what is social phobia? It's, a, it's natural to feel self-conscious, nervous, or shy in front of others at times. Most people get through these moments when they need to. But for some, the anxiety that goes with feeling shy or self-conscious can be extreme. When people feel so self-conscious and anxious that it prevents them from speaking up or socializing most of the time, it's probably more than just shyness. It may be an anxiety condition called social phobia. So what happens when someone has social phobia? Well, extreme feelings of shyness and self-consciousness spilled into a powerful fear. As a result, a person feels uncomfortable participating in everyday social situations. People with social phobia can usually interact easily with family and a few close friends, but meeting new people, talking in a group, or speaking in public can cause their extreme shyness to kick in. 
with social phobia, a person's extreme shyness, self-consciousness, and fears of embarrassment get in the way of life. Instead of enjoying social activities, people with social phobia might dread them and avoid some of them altogether. So what causes social phobia? <clears throat> like other phobias, social phobia is a fear reaction to something that isn't actually dangerous, although the body and mind react as if the danger is real. This means that someone feels physical sensations of fear, like a faster heartbeat and breathing. These are part of the body's fight-or-flight response. They're caused by a rush of adrenaline and other chemicals that prepare the body to either fight or make a quick getaway. This biological mechanism kicks in when they feel afraid. It's a built-in nervous system response that alerts us to danger so we can protect ourselves. With social phobia, this response gets activated too often, too strongly, and in situations where it's out of place. Because the physical sensations that go into the response are real, and sometimes quite strong, the danger seems real too, so the person will react by freezing up and will feel unable to interact. As the body experiences these physical sensations, the mind goes through emotions like feeling afraid or nervous. People with social phobia tend to interpret these sensations and emotions in a way that leads them to avoid the situation. They might say, uh-oh, my heart's pounding, this must be dangerous, I'd better not do it. While someone else might interpret the same physical sensations of nervousness a different way. They might say, okay, that's just my heart beating fast. It gets me a little nervous because it's almost my turn to speak, but it happens every time, so it's no big deal. So, with that in mind, you know, we talked last week about the shyness that both you and I suffer from. And the question kind of comes up now is, is that shyness controllable or is that shyness something that controls us? And I think that's kind of where I, I'm not, you know, a clinical psychologist or anything like that. So when I think of phobias and I think of normal fears, <clears throat> that's kind of where I draw that line. Do I control that fear or does that fear control me? And if that fear controls me, I tend to think of it more along the lines of it being a phobia. Does your shyness control you or do you control the shyness? Um, I guess it can be both in certain situations. I definitely think my shyness can control me to a point where I have the anxiety and it controls me to not do certain things. While in other instances, I kind of control the shyness and the fact that, like, it's either I personally don't want to do it or it's something that I will do despite the shyness. So we've talked about fears and phobias on the podcast in the past. And, and I certainly <clears throat> don't want to bring up a painful topic, but one phobia that we've definitely determined you have is arachnophobia. You're afraid of spiders. And it's almost a crippling fear of spiders that you've suffered from for a long time now. Does your shyness fall into the same category as your fear of spiders? Being honest, not really. Uh, it's not as crippling as my fear of spiders, because my fear of spiders has just stop me like I will if I see a spider I will not go in that room it can be my bedroom it can be the bathroom I will not go in that room you cannot make me go in that room unless the spider is either out of it or killed so it's it's probably fair to say that you don't have social phobia if that's the case yeah probably um otherwise we'd have to kind of categorize the two of those in a very similar level of fear um, I don't think I have social phobia myself either. I think mine tends to just be that awkward shyness that I might try to avoid a situation. But it's funny because after talking about shyness last week, I found a couple of situations that I would normally have not engaged in at work because it would have it required me to to speak in, in front of a group and I saw the opportunity and I attacked it and I just, you know, I went for it and, and it kind of felt good. You know, it was something that I would have avoided doing, but if I had to do it, I could have, 
But after having our talk last week, it was one of those, well, let's give this a shot and see how it works. And it worked out pretty well. So I don't think I suffer from social phobia either. So I think that's good. I think we're we're both in a good place here. I think we kind of understand what social phobia is, even though we don't suffer from it. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back and talk about how social phobia can affect someone's life. We'll be right back. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights in the Teens. Today we're talking about social phobia. And now we're going to talk about how social phobia can affect someone's life. With social phobia, thoughts and fears about what others think get exaggerated in someone's mind. The person starts to focus on the embarrassing things that could happen instead of the good things. This makes a situation seem much worse than it is and influences a person to avoid it. Sorry, I'm over, I'm over here pushing buttons on the mixer. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. I'm sorry. You're good. <laughs> Some of the ways social phobia can affect someone's life include feeling lonely or disappointed over missed opportunities for friendship and fun. Social phobia might prevent someone from chatting with friends in the lunchroom, joining an after-school club, going to a party, or asking someone on a date. Not getting the most out of school is another problem. Social phobia might keep a person from volunteering an answer in class, reading aloud, or giving a presentation. Someone with social phobia might feel too nervous to ask a question in class or go to a teacher for help. There's also missing a chance to share their talents and new skills. Social phobia might prevent someone from auditioning for the school play, being in the talent show, trying out for a team, or joining in a service project. Social phobia not only prevents people from trying new things, but it also prevents them from making the normal, everyday mistakes that help people improve their skills, for, their skills further. So we talked about this a little bit last week about some of the impacts that being shy could have. And we had talked about the impact on school and how sometimes it might prevent you from raising your hand if you're, you know, like you said, you didn't want to have the wrong answer. Have you ever experienced a situation when you're in class where you knew you should be participating or you felt you should be participating and you didn't because you were afraid of something like that? I mean, there have been like, a few instances, some, uh, specifically when, like, there were other people in the class who really weren't willing to answer, and I knew that I, you know, should participate and having some sort of participation so that, you know, we can move class along, and I was scared that, like, I would possibly have the wrong answer, so I just didn't answer. All right, so it sounds like kind of a mild version of that. Has happened in the past. Yeah. What about showcasing your talent? Uh, one of the things that I really appreciate about you is the fact that you are artistic in a lot of different ways. Music, drawing, writing. You have a lot of different ways to express your creative side. Does your shyness hold you back from expressing that to others? Is it something where you just create and keep it to yourself and 
to mommy and I, or do you show it to other people? I mean, I'd like to show my art to other people, and I did that when I was younger, specifically when I ended up making comics, and in aftercare, whenever we had, like, reading time, I would get my comics out and show everybody. Uh, and, like, I still share some of my projects with my friends, like my friend Aaron, I tell him the stories that I make, uh, and I've read some of them to him. Um, not really... Aren't recently, I haven't really been showing people, though, besides you and Mommy. So there are opportunities for you to showcase your, your art. There have been art shows where your art has been put on display. There have been times where you've had a chance to write and be published. They've all kind of been school assignments, though. Have you participated in, in those when those opportunities came about? Well, yeah, a lot of the times, uh, most of them were required, being completely honest. Um, but, you know, I still put my creativity in it, and whenever there is a school assignment that allows you to be more creative, I, you know, showcase that. Now, if it wasn't required, would you have still done it? I guess it depends really what it was. It may not have been specifically the art, but whether I wanted to... I felt... Like, putting the full effort in of, like, ex like the whole, like, more school scholastic aspect of it and less of the artistic aspect of it. But, like, some of the writing assignments I thought were kind of neat. So, maybe I would have. Maybe I wouldn't. It really just depended on what the assignment was, I guess. Okay. That, that makes sense. I can buy that. So, why do some people develop social phobia? Kids, teens, and adults can have social phobia. Most of the time, it starts with a person is young. Like other anxiety problems, social phobia develops because of a combination of different factors. And one of these factors can be a person's biological makeup. Social phobia could be partly due to the genes and temperament a person inherits. Inherited genetic traits from parents and other relatives can influence how the brain senses and regulates anxiety, shyness, nervousness, and stress reactions. Likewise, some people are born with a shy temperament and, and tend to be cautious and sensitive in new situations and prefer what's familiar. Most people who develop social phobia have always had a shy temperament. Not everyone with a shy temperament develops social phobia. In fact, most don't. It's the same with the genes. But people who inherit these traits do have in, an increased chance of developing social phobia. Behaviors learned from role models is another factor, especially parents. A person's naturally shy temperament can be influenced by what he or she learns from role models. If parents and others react by overprotecting a child who is shy, the child won't have a chance to get used to new situations and new people. Over time, shyness can build into social phobia. Shy parents might also unintentionally set an example by avoiding certain social interactions. A shy child who watches this learns that socializing is uncomfortable, distressing, and something to avoid. And the final factor is life events and experiences. If people born with a cautious nature have stressful experiences, it can make them even more cautious and shy. Feeling pressure to interact in ways they don't feel ready for, being criticized or humiliated, or even having other fears and worries can make them more likely for a shy or feel f can make it more likely for a shy or fearful person to develop social anxiety. People who consistent who constantly receive critical or disapproving reactions may grow to expect that others will judge them negatively. Being teased or bullied will make people who are already shy likely to retreat to their shells even more. They'll be scared of making a mistake or disappointing someone, and they'll be more sensitive to criticism. The good news is that the effect of these negative experiences can be turned around with some focused, slow but steady effort. Fear can be learned, and it can be unlearned too. So, what do you think contributes to your shyness of these three factors? Is it biological makeup? Is it learned behavior? 
from role models or is it from life events and experiences that have kind of made you shy like you are now? Well, I don't necessarily know, but my biological makeup necessarily right now, so I can't really say it's that. Um, learned behavior from role models. Despite the fact that mommy is a very outgoing person, I think a lot of my shyness uh, can tend to be learned from you, probably. So it really is my fault. <laughs> it's not. Just, <laughs> again, there's other factors. So you being a shy person, as you've admitted, and not really being interested in socializing with people, I do think has kind of had an effect on me. Um, I know you really don't like socializing, you don't have many friends, and you get annoyed by people easily. So That is true, yes. And despite the fact that I have a decent friend group, I definitely get annoyed at people easily and don't trust people easily, much like how you do. So I'm assuming that some of my shyness probably was learned from being around you. Well, I guess that's possible. You know, it's funny, I, I'm probably a significantly different story than you. Both of my parents were very outgoing. My mother was the type of person that could strike up a conversation with anybody, and she usually did. And my father, everybody loved my father. My father was always the life of the party wherever he went. So I didn't have that uh, role model influence that caused it. And obviously I didn't have the genetic makeup because... You know, one side of my family was Irish, and Irish people tend to be very outgoing for the most part. I think I, I would attribute most of the reason I am the way I am today to life events. You know, being a big guy my whole life, there's always attention placed on you because you're the biggest guy in the room. Uh, and that attention is is unwanted and unwarranted attention. So whenever you you get that kind of attention there's a negative feeling around it and it was one of those types of battles that I faced for a very long time in my life uh, it wasn't until I was probably in my 30s that I just realized I didn't care what other people thought about the way I looked it was my life and I was going to live it and I stopped letting it bother me but you know that's 30 some years of that reinforcing of that shyness and that awkwardness um and it's hard to kind of break away from that the fact that i'm doing you know podcasts now i think is a breakthrough for me because i'm kind of throwing myself out there like i, I never would have in the past but i think it's kind of interesting how we you and i both have kind of reached the same point in our shyness we have a lot of similarities in what our shyness does to us and what it restricts us for. But we kind of got to them differently. What are your thoughts on that? I definitely find it interesting. And it just goes to show that so many different factors can go into shyness that you can still end up at the same point no matter what. It's like you have different star it's it's kind of the same analogy I have with math. It's like there's so many ways to solve different problems, but there always seems to be one answer to it. Yeah. Now do you have friends that you think might be suffering from social phobia or extreme I don't even want to say so social phobia because I don't want to attach a a stigma to it. You know, social phobia is an actual medically diagnosed condition but do you have anyone who's maybe borderline there or extremely shy that might be more negatively impacted by that than you um i don't really think any of my current friends because like from what <sighs> i've seen all the friends that I talk to and all the friends that I'm with, they, like, are able to have a ton of other friends. They, like, seem quite social, and I guess the only person I could really see that with is possibly uh, my friend Carly. Um, not that, like, she has those issues, because, like, she has a lot of friends and she's pretty social, but... I can see, like, some nervousness going on, and she's told me that, like, she 
before she ended up coming up to me and talking to me at band, like, she never really talked to anybody. Right. Um, she has a ton of friends, but something tells me that, like, she is still kind of shy. Yeah. And, and you know, it, shyness is natural in, in teens. It's natural in people in general. So I don't, I don't, I certainly don't think that's a negative type of thing. Um, nor is it something you necessarily have to get help with. But have you ever talked to anybody, you know, school counselors or anyone about shyness? Have you ever been confronted on shyness or a lack of participation or anything like that by anyone? Um, well, outside of, well, hmm. I don't really even know if the one counselor I was talking to is really kind of discussed it with me like (laughs) (laughs) we discuss other issues that go on this isn't really one that's come up all that much and making friends the closest we've come is talking about clubs and whatnot but nothing about like shyness and social phobia actually ended up coming up at that point um i mean i talk with friends i seem to have some sort of a social life um so i haven't really I don't know if I've directly mentioned it to anybody besides, like, you and Mommy. Like, I may, like, casually mention, like, how I'm not good at socializing with my friends. Or, you know, I'll just talk to myself and, you know, tell myself that, hey, you really need to be more open to people. And then I realize that, hey, I'm way more bad at socializing because I'm just talking to myself about this. Okay. I I can certainly see that. But we're going to take our next break, our last break, actually. And when we come back, we're going to talk about how to deal with social phobia. We'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today we're talking about social phobia. And now we're going to discuss dealing with social phobia. People with social phobia can learn to manage fear, develop confidence and coping skills, and stop avoiding things that make them anxious. But, like everything, it's not always easy. Overcoming social phobia means getting up the courage it takes to go beyond what's comfortable little by little. Who can help support and guide people in overcoming social phobia? Well, therapists can help people recognize the physical sensations caused by the fight or flight, and teach them to interpret these sensations more accurately. Therapists can help provide, uh, can help people create a plan for facing social fears one by one and help them build the social skills and confidence to do it. This includes practicing new behaviors. Sometimes, but not always, medications that reduce anxiety are used as part of the treatment for social phobia. Family or friends are especially important for people who are dealing with social phobia. The right support from a few key people can help those with social phobia gather the courage to go outside their comfort zone and try something new. Put-downs, lectures, criticisms, and demands to change don't help, and it just makes a person feel bad. Having social phobia isn't a person's fault and isn't something anyone chooses. Instead, Friends and family can encourage people with social phobia to pick a small goal to aim for, remind them to go for it, and be there when they might feel discouraged. Good friends and family are there to celebrate each small success along the way. Social, uh, dealing with social phobia takes patience, 
courage to face fears and try new things, and the willingness to practice. It takes a commitment to go forward rather than back away from uh, feeling shy. Little by little, someone who decides to deal with extreme shyness can learn to be more comfortable. Each small step forward helps build enough confidence to take the next small step. As shyness and fears begin to melt, confidence and positive feelings build. Pretty soon, the person's thinking less about what might feel uncomfortable and more about what might be fun. So let me ask you, what steps, before we even get to that, do you feel you're less shy or more shy today than you were five years ago, four years ago? Well, I'd honestly say that I'm a little less shy than how I was a few years ago. Because that was probably around the time I was in sixth grade, and I had a lot of shyness back then. I was going through a lot during that time. The f I had very few friends, and the few friends that I had, I either got into fights with or they moved away completely. So I, and like, I felt completely alienated by my class and I just felt like I didn't really have a lot of people and the few people that I had, again, either we had fights or I didn't see them all that often. So how do you think you got from there to here? Was it a conscious effort? Was it just by default? Was it just surviving adversity? Like, was there a deliberate effort to try to overcome some of these things, or was it just surviving? Well, I think a lot of it probably had to do with the start of the podcast. I honestly have the podcast to thank for a lot when it came to how I was feeling, and you saw how I was acting when I was going through these the really tough times of my life, and you thought that making a podcast and showing and like trying to work through them with me like this and also giving it to people who may have also been going through it would help and honestly I feel it has and I've talked about how it's helped me deal with my emotions and all these other topics that we've already discussed and I guess it could also have done something when it came to my shyness I mean you look back at the first few episodes, I barely talked. I barely said anything into the podcast. You had to constantly get me to talk, and I only gave really short answers. And you see me now, and I've been monologuing for however many minutes. <laughs> and so I can probably have the podcast to thank for a lot of it because it helped to open me up more. And then I also think the idea of having all the schools meshed together in middle school also, and having a ton of other kids from different schools might also had a factor in it as well. Have Have there been any factors specifically in school? I mean, I know <clears throat> you had multiple middle schools show up at high school at one time, and you're kind of flooded with a new batch of kids that you've not been exposed to. Have there been events at schools? Have at school has there been? Um, clubs have there been any kind of activities at school that or even teachers you know would qualify has there been anything that the school itself has done that you think may have contributed to getting you to where you are today um well mm, i don't I don't really know. I think one of the things might have been how the classes, mainly, that, like, I kind of got squished into because being in all these higher up classes, you're kind of in the same classes with a majority of the people. And with the people I was in a ton of classes with, I started, you know, gaining friendship points with. And, like, I started talking with them and interacting with them. So... I could think of that. Um, I guess also the clubs I've been trying to join, like uh, I've done a marching band, even though it's probably not, uh, as, I wasn't as social, it wasn't as big of a social uh, 
thing as I had hoped, I made Carly as a friend, and eventually, uh, Natalie and Madeline ended up joining, and I made, a f and I got a better relationship with my friend Summer, and, you know, I could see that that might have had a bit of an impact. Okay. Uh, let me kind of reverse that a little bit and ask, has there been anything negative that came out of school? We'll stick to school. Has there been anything negative, experiences, clubs, interactions, individuals without naming names that had a negative impact on that that may have made you struggle a little bit more than you would have? Well, I guess the biggest thing we can probably bring up is the pandemic because, you know, that stopped a lot of socializing and it also made me realize that I could live perfectly fine with hardly talking to people. So having that realization probably harmed me, but surprisingly, I think after the pandemic, I was act I was slightly more social, but you know, I can definitely see, but it's definitely damaged me in the fact that I wasn't able to join clubs and because I didn't join because like that had really stopped me from joining clubs. And this was like the first year I've actually tried to join clubs, even though I wanted to join them in seventh grade and then the pandemic ruined all of that. Uh, and then I guess some more negative experiences, partially with marching band might have also had uh, instances that may have put me in a more negative mood of socialization. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the effects of COVID. So everybody was basically locked down for almost a year straight, m longer in some areas. Um, and most people, when the lockdowns kind of started to lift, even before they started to lift, people were just jonesing to get out of the house. They were, they were desperate to go see people, desperate to spend time with family. When things started to lighten up, did that inspire you to be more social? Did you have a desire to it? Or was that a desire, was that an effect that was transferred from mommy and I wanting to be more social that just kind of fell on you? Uh, being completely honest, I didn't really like the fact that we had to go back to school. I didn't really l like the idea of being around people knowing the danger of it. And even though it was, you know, safer, like even when they, we, they, we were doing hybrid during eighth grade, I didn't go back. I stayed remote the entire year. And when we basically were forced to go back, I kind of wasn't really willing to do that. Yes, and, and neither were many other uh, people either, both work and with school. So let me ask you one last question. <clears throat> How much of you contributes negatively to being shy? Uh, probably my harsh criticisms about myself and the fact that I hold myself to really high expectations. That's really... Uh, I guess where it comes into play when a lot of social situations, much like I said earlier and last week, I don't really like to answer questions, because certain questions, because I'm scared that I'd get it wrong. That is mainly due in part to how I over-criticize myself and say that if I get even the slightest thing wrong, I'm a failure. I really, it shouldn't be happening. I should always strive for perfection, and if I can't meet that, then well, all hope is lost or whatever. Well, and I think it's worth noting that we're all a work in progress. None of us are perfect. None of us are ever going to be perfect. Um, but I think it's important to understand that as hard as we can be on ourselves, and you can be very hard on yourself, you have to be kind to yourself. You have to give yourself a little bit of understanding. We all make mistakes. There's nothing wrong with making mistakes as long as you learn from them. So, you know, I know you can be your hardest critic at times. And as a parent, it's very difficult for me to, to sit by and watch that and not be able to do anything about it. Um, but in the end, ultimately, you have, to, you have to have the drive yourself to change and to improve these things. And if you get to the point where you don't want to be shy, you want to be social, 
then ultimately it's upon you, it's incumbent upon you to make that happen. As much as mommy and I and anybody else can help you, there has to be a conscious decision. And and I say this not just to you, but I say this to everyone out there who might be suffering from shyness at higher degrees. You have to want to get by it. And until you are, you can't consider yourself a failure if you don't set a goal, right? You can't fail a goal that doesn't exist. So if you don't want to get over shyness and you're comfortable being who you are and, and the way you are and, you know, enduring the things that you endure, then you're not a failure for being what other people think that you might should be. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to be who you are. And if you're shy and you're quiet and you're not the kind of person who wants to get up and, and you know, give an exposition to an a audience, then there's nothing wrong with that either. Uh, I think my my moral here is that if if it's to the point that it's stopping you from doing things and it's causing other anxieties and other health issues, then it's probably, that's where we're, we're borderline with social phobia and it probably needs to be, you know, taken care of by a professional, right? And I don't think you're there yet. And I don't think you're going there because clearly you're getting better with it. So I think I think you're in a good spot right now. All right. So I think that was all we had today. We're going to take a quick break, come back, and get your closing thoughts and finish up the business of the podcast. All righty. We'll be right back. All right. So to everyone out there, I just want to bring the message up more about uh, the idea of social phobia. Uh, Sometimes people can be so afraid of socializing that it can genuinely be a detriment to their physical and mental well-being, and that's not good. And if you or someone you know is experiencing something like that, I would definitely recommend either some getting some form of help having a good support group or talking to a professional is certainly recommended and obviously we're not professionals but you know we we can provide you the sources and you know help you get on that journey for self-improvement all right sage advice as always thank you uh, before we do go, I would once again implore our listening and viewing audience to uh, subscribe to the podcast if you don't already. Uh, you can get uh, what can you get? You can get you can get something. You can audio. get audio versions. Thank you, audio versions of this podcast listed as insights into teens. You can get audio and ver- video versions of all the network's podcasts listed as insights into things. Uh, we're available on Pandora, Castro, Stitcher, pretty much anywhere you can get a podcast. Uh, I would also encourage you to give us your feedback right in. You can email us at comments at insights into things.com. We do stream five days or at least we try to stream five days a week on Twitch. We had some technical difficulties today with our internet connection. Wah, wah, wah. Exactly. You can catch us on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can find us on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things, or you can get links to all that and much more on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com. And you. And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights into Entertainment, usually hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights into Tomorrow are not really any more monthly podcast, but we're working on it, hosted by you and normally my brother Sam. All right, that's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye.